I think so. Okay. And certainly for a middle school graduation. Elementary school, not even middle school. Okay. Clown costume might be the way to go. Uh, that's for Princeton. Okay. Uh, Simpsons reference. Okay, so the homework problem was to see if you could do better than what we have over here. This got slightly less than 50%, 40%. You could add more and more and get as close to 50% as you want, but you would still not be at 50%. So does anybody have any great suggestions of things to do? I know at least one person does, but he stepped out. Okay, <laughs> what, what should we do? Well, I know oh. something I should say. Okay. Seven, four. Anybody have any thoughts as to what we could do next? Besides, <laughs> and so this got us forty percent. Anybody have any good arrangements? Did a number three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten? What was a good number to look at next? Seven. Seven. Well, but you know, some deep theory. Yeah. Well, I don't know if it's deep. <laughs> 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 from so, memory, let's do that. <laughs> all right. So I will. I will try to hold up the cube so that they can be seen. So. I will just quickly show it over here. So this is one of the cubes that I love. I, I love to do cubes. If you look at this, it looks like this is the red side of the cube. And if you want, you can call it the red side, but that's not the right way to look at it. Really, this is the front side. You have to hold it at a 45 degree angle. And if you hold it at a 45 degree angle, it's almost the same as a normal three by three Rubik's cube. There's a few little twists on it. But it's very similar if you do it like that, and you can now turn it normally. If you hold the red side, you can't really turn the red side. This is another one that's very similar, except instead of being a 45 degree angle, it's different. So it now looks two by three on some sides. Yeah. The, the same theory to solve almost all of it as the regular three by three cube. There's a few slight differences, but nothing significant. You just have to be a little bit more careful. And the reason I like to show these is one, I can now use my research funds to buy Rubik's Cubes. But more importantly, it shows the value of the right perspective, of looking at things the right way. One of the things we've been emphasizing in our discussions is when you have algebra, if you look at algebra the right way, it can scream at you, this is the simplification, this is the combinatorial story. And it's very hard to see what that story is. Uh, my daughter had a cube like this in her classroom, except instead of having different colors, it was all the same color. Now, if it was all the same color, it would be very easy to solve. But the twist was that the sides were different thicknesses. And so when you mix it up, you can have this strange explosion coming out. And it took me a while before I realized, oh, if I hold it like this at a 45 degree angle, it's the same as a regular cube. So for today, right now, we're still looking at things in the plane because I'm drawing all the things in the plane, but there's nothing that says you have to view things two dimensionally. So in terms of when you're thinking about how to do this, did you try to think about things in three, four, five, six, seven dimensions? Or since we started the plane, did you keep looking at the plane? And this is a great point to discuss with students as to how we add additional assumptions to problems that aren't there. So one solution is to try to do things with triangles or with squares. And both of them will actually get 50%. So if you have two points that are data and then the blue check digit, uh, if there's an error in this one and an error in this one. The only intersection of those two lines is right over here. So that's going to be the error. If it's just on this line and nothing else, then it's going to be the check digit. So both of these will be 50%. Which do you think is better, the triangle or the square? The square. Why is the square better? <laughs> it's, it's base two. In terms of generalizing, I think the square generalizes a lot easier. If I wanted to go to you know, a three by three square, I can see very clearly how to do that. It's a little bit harder to see what's going on with the triangle. But there is a reason why the triangle is better. Any thoughts as to why the triangle is better? Um, you should stay quiet for a little bit as you are the co-author. <laughs> but if nobody speaks up, then you can speak. So he said it so quietly. He right? did. Which do you think is going to be better in terms of multiple errors? Your multiple errors should be rare. But which would you rather do, the triangle or the square? Triangle. Because the triangle is communicating 50% using just six bits, whereas this is communicating 50% using eight bits. 
So there's a more of a chance of having two errors with the eight than the six. Okay, so both are 50%. You need fewer with the triangle, so that's good. So what should we do next? Five, six, seven, eight, or nine? Well, the triangle numbers, you know, one, three, six, 10. So that says, this is a natural string of numbers to be looking at. For the square numbers, you know, one, four, nine, 16, that's another one. Could you get something good with, you know, seven? Yes, it has been remarked, but it's a different construction. You know, what about eight? Is there a good construction for eight? And so here's one way to do a triangle with six, and another way to do a square with nine. The square is very easy to describe what's going on. I don't even have to say anything. For the triangle, well, these three on the bottom are on a line, the two sides are on a line, but then I have the three midpoints that aren't on a line, so I'll plunk down a blue dot in the middle and draw a circle around it. So this works, but it's a little bit more involved to describe. They both give 60%. But again, the triangle is doing it with fewer data points. So I would give the win to the triangle. It's a little bit more inconvenient, but I'm not the programmer. So I just found that out. Now, there's another way to draw the triangle. And in fact, there's many different ways to draw it. I like this way of drawing it a little bit better because it suggests how you might generalize it. And you have to remember that we don't have to draw pictures. And we've always been told, you know, especially when you're lecturing, your know, pictures worth a thousand words, draw illustrations. But at the end of the day, we are not doing this by drawing pictures and putting little codes on that. We have a computer assignment that says, take these digits and use this to generate this check digit. Take these digits and use it to generate this check digit. So in terms of generalization, I don't worry too much about drawing larger and larger pictures. So what I did here is this three is my original one that tell me three times. Then the next one is the expanding out to six. And then what I do is I continue each line and add a new check digit. And then I take the points that were the check digits before and I connect them and I draw a line like that. And this suggests a possible way to keep generalizing how to draw the triangle. You may not want to continue to draw it, but at least suggests what to do. All right, so the triangle, uh, the n triangle number is n, n plus one over two. So if you go through the calculation, you get n over n plus two is information. So that's really good in the limit. And the square, uh, SN has n squared, two n of check digits. So you also get n over n plus two. But again, it takes a little bit more. So if there are two bit errors, you're more likely to have that affect you with the square than with the triangle. All right, so we can get as high of a percentage as we want, but the sizes are getting larger and larger and larger. And as the size gets very large, you then do have to start worrying a little bit more about your two bit errors. So is there a better geometry to use? Probably, because I still have, as I said, lots of dots left. <coughs> So here are some standard Rubik's cubes. And so if you use standard Rubik's cubes, what we can do is just generalize what we were doing before. We had check digits for lines. Now we'll have check digits for planes. So how many planes do I need for the two by two cube? I'll need six planes, top and bottom, say left and right, front and back. For the three by three, I'll have top, middle, bottom, uh, left, middle, right, different middle, and then you know, find different middle and back. And you can start to see how things go. So if I do the two by two by two, I have eight data points. I'm gonna have six check digit points. So I'm going to have an efficiency of 57%. This is actually less than the 60% we had a moment ago, but that's okay, it's just small values. If a lot of times, if you're comparing two different functions, if you're comparing um, you know, four n squared to n cubed, 4n squared might be doing better in the beginning, but eventually n cubed is gonna kick in and win. And so when you're trying to look at the efficiencies, don't be so concerned about the small values. So let's just make sure that it works. Imagine that the left has an error. The check digit sum doesn't work. I now know that there's an error in either one of the four oranges or the check digit here. If there's an error in the top one, I know it's either the check digit for the top or one of the four blues. Well, since I already know there's an error with the two oranges, it's gonna be either the front or the back orange. Now, if I look at the front face, if there's no check digit error there, then I know the error has to be the one in the back. If there is a check digit error, I know it has to be the one there. And if you just go through all the calculations, all of the pieces of data are uniquely specified by the planes. If I go to a three by three by three, it gets much better. I now hit 75%. And just to put things in comparison, if I do a six by six data square, I would get 75% but I would have to use 48 uh, pieces of 
information to transmit 36. If I use the triangle, the seventh triangle number, I have 36 pieces that I sent, 36 bits, so the same as the three by three cube, a 77.78% efficiency. So I just barely win with the triangle. You know, I'm winning by one over 36. So already the three by three cube is pretty close. You could of course then go to the four by four cube and higher and higher and higher. I think I said that without swearing. Uh, there's other types of cubes you could look at. Uh, you know, here's a nice one where you have pentagons on the sides. What if you tried other types of geometry? You know, could you do better like that? And so for a given number of points, what is the best dimension? What is the best configuration you can use for that? And then how do you generalize and construct families from that? And so I've deliberately not thought about what is best. And I have saved this as a project for some high school students to think about. Uh, going by, going on with, since I know people care, the four by four by four cube would be 64 data points, 12 check digits. So already at 84% roughly. For the nine by nine data square, it's only 81.82%. For the T11 triangle, it's 83.54%. So at this point, we've now beaten the triangle. The triangle needs 79 data points. The cube needs only 76. The efficiency for the triangle is only 83.54%. The efficiency for the four cube is 84.21. All right, in general, what will it be in the limit? Well, if I have an n by n by n cube, I have n cube data points, and you have to look at how many check fits do I have? Well, it's, I have n planes in each of the three directions, so I have three n check digits. So when you do the algebra, you get the info is n squared divided by n squared plus three. So this is much better than we were getting with the triangles and the squares, where we were like n over n plus two. So things are going much faster now with that. And then the question is, how can you continue to generalize this? So as has been remarked, there are better ways than this. So this is not how things are done. Uh, the better way, which we'll do in a moment, is the Hamming code. But what I like about this is, this is a very easy problem to describe to students. And I've had elementary school kids figure out some of the generalizations, you know, coming up with you know, six points or you know, coming up with the squares and just having them given openness. You know, I've only done the very beginning to tell me three times, how would you push things forward? And as was remarked just that it's great when we can give students the opportunity to think and be creative. And they don't have to come up with the optimal stuff. You know, they can just come up with something better. Yes? When you say elementary, what grade are you talking about? Uh, third through six. So for the math club at school, it's fourth through six. And since this is being recorded, I'll do a shout out to our provost's son, who's in third grade, but has been outstanding in math for years. He and my daughter had cubbies next to each other in preschool. So I got to know him and his family very well through pickups. All right, so as was remarked, there is something better you can do with seven points. It is the Hamming code. So I have, you're called in Hamming out of Manhattan in terms of this is going to be my city grid. So I will have four data points. And then rather than using blue for the check digits, I'm, I have a son who really loves trains and the subway system. I'll have different lines. I'll have the blue line, the orange line, and the green line. And each one of them will be a different check digit. So for this one, I'm looking at these three, for, uh, third, fifth, and seventh, coming up with this first check digit point. For the second one, it's gonna be linked with the third, sixth, and seventh. And for the fourth one, it's going to be linked with the fifth, sixth, and seventh. So there are reasons the numbers are going one, two, four, three, five, six, seven. If you go online, they will talk to you about why they're doing it like this. Base two should be screaming at you when you see something like this. You know, seven is one less than two cubed. There are reasons in terms of over here, these are the powers of two down here. That's what's coming in as the check digits. And there are natural generalizations of this. So if there are no errors, well, then everything is correct. Imagine that there's only one color error. Well, if there's only one error, it can't be one of the pieces of data because if there's one of the pieces of data that's wrong, each piece of data is on exactly two subway lines. So if there's only one error, it has to be one of the check digits and we know which check digit it is. If just blue and orange are wrong, well, then it's gotta be one of the first, you know, one of these three data points, you know, three, five, seven, or the blue check for blue. If it's orange that's wrong, it's gonna be either three, six, seven, or the orange. Well, the only thing that's common to both of them, have I done this right? Uh, did I draw this wrong? Wait a minute. Okay. 
But what I'm saying is, what about D4? Did I draw? I'm wondering if I just drew this wrong right now. I think your third blue line was supposed to go to um, I think my third blue line is supposed to go to yeah, D3. Yeah, there are three lines going into. Right, so, okay, so this picture has to be fixed because uh, it, it should be like that. So the third blue line, I think, should be going to D3. And then. Oh, wait, wait a minute. No, 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 no. Because if there's an error with D4, there would also be an error with the green line. That's the issue. So if, so if the blue and the orange are wrong, the only things that are both blue and orange are D1 and D7. But D7, well, I'm sorry, I guess I'm going with D4, the point 0.7, is also on the green line. And then the green would be wrong as well. Oh, good. Hemming code still work. It would be terrible <laughs> if we had to change everything that's being implemented. Uh, and so I would then detect an error on the green. Since I don't detect an error on the green, 0.7 D4 can't be wrong, and it has to be the data point D1. And you just keep going through this, all the other cases. If it's just blue and green, well, what do blue and green share? Blue and green share the 0.7, which is D4. Blue and green also share D5. But D4 is also on the orange line. And since the orange line is not an error, then the error has to be just the point D2. And so you can just go through this. It's not that bad of a calculation. There's not that many possibilities. And you can see that it will correct any one uh, bit of error. And your efficiency is going to be four sevenths. So with just seven points, you're already breaking 50%. And of course, there are generalizations of this. If you want to have a higher efficiency and use more points, there are also generalizations if you want to be able to correct two-bit errors or three-bit errors. Okay, and so say we want to transmit around you know, 4,096 bits of data. It's always nice to work with powers of two. We could do a square, we could a cube, we could look at a corresponding Hamming code, and let's just get a sense of the comparison. So with a square, we have an efficiency of you know, 4,096 out of 4,224 pieces of data, of the actual data for 96.969%. For the cube, 4,096 out of 4,144 are data about 98.8417%. And using the corresponding Hamming code, 4,083 out of 4,095 for 99.707%. So the Hamming code is more efficient. But the amount we're talking about now on the order of you know, 1%. So the savings is not tremendous when you're using very large values. If you're using small codes, then there's a tremendous difference. If you can get a 1% savings, it's worth getting the 1% savings, but it's nice to know that you're not missing by that much. And if the students are just playing with things, that what they're getting is not that far from optimal. And you get a sense of you know, what you then need to go much further. All right, and then the last one is my brother uh, basically told me, I think he'd be close to disowning me if I didn't mention this. And this goes to the difference between theory and applications. So, Imagine you want to transmit an error. We like to make assumptions, but what if those assumptions aren't met in the real world? So one of the assumptions is that, you know, we have a high probability of transmitting bits correctly. And we hope that we don't have that many errors. But what if there is an error? Why is there an error? Maybe there's some phenomenon going on that's interfering with the signal. Maybe a solar flare or something, or maybe something else on the line. So it's possible that if there's an error, that the bits that are affected are dependent. That maybe a certain chunk of your message is more likely to have all of those bits flipped or some of those bits flipped, that the error could be localized. So imagine we do have a localized burst of noise and the digits in red are mistransmitted or are the ones that are affected. Um, they seem to be the same. They seem to be the same. So what I'll say, so I should probably change those to the other ones or just, error. my error has an error. Um, so over there, uh, those ones should be the ones changed. So the problem is, if you transmit something like this, you are likely to run into trouble because you will now have two or three bit errors in a small segment. What can you do to fix this? So any thoughts? And again, a lot of it comes down to the perspective. We can spend time preparing our signal to transmit on our end, and we can have time spent on the other end, you know, reformatting 
the signal that's received. You know, the computers work very fast. It's nice to get the data in the correct order, but we don't have to do that. You know, we can take huge chunks of data and decide how we want to transmit that. And then at the other end, you take huge chunks of data and unfold it. So any thoughts as to how we might want to send the data? In blocks? Yeah, in blocks. So how would you do it in blocks? What would the first block be? Seven. <laughs> well, if you do it in blocks of seven, then a localized error will hit you in one of your blocks. So that's what we're doing right now. Say we're saying something in blocks of seven. If there's a burst of noise like this, then you could have one block with multiple errors. So we can't have the block be consecutive. So how else could we do it? And it's related to some of the math we did earlier. You can talk now. <laughs> blocks of seven, but we're going to start with the first and the eighth and the 15th and the 22nd. It's our old friend clock arithmetic. So uh, I just did every fourth, but you know, every seventh, whatever you want to do would be much better. So now we take a message like this and then we transfer it out like this. And so I think what I'm saying is the words of the digits that are likely to be affected when we are transmitting. I'll try to use that as a save. And now if you do something like this, know that the digits are actually going to be spread out. And your probably blocks of four might not be great because if you have a little burst, it could be bad. You might do blocks of a hundred or a thousand. And if you're transmitting a lot of data like this, now you've spread things out so that if there are local correlations, they're now in different blocks and they're not going to affect each other. So in terms of implementation, this is a little bit more work, but it's not a tremendous amount of work. You need to just have the signal in advance and you need to just pass it. Or you just load a little bit of it into a buffer. Yes? I'm, I'm a little confused what you mean by transmit every four. Okay, so right now, normally what we would do is we would just send one zero one 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 zero one zero zero one zero one. Now we send every fourth, we send one, Step, step, step one, step, step, step zero. Okay. One, uh, one, step, step, step one. And then that would be the first thing that we send. Then the next thing we send would be one, step, step, step zero, step, step, step one. Now the problem with that is if you wanted to build the signal on the other end, you have to wait for each of the blocks to be transmitted. You can't be building some of the messages you come along. But for a lot of things you send, you need the whole message before you can unwind it. You know, if you're doing something like RSA, it's not enough to have just part of the number. You need the whole number. So, you know, interleaving like this is not bad at all. And what I love is this is a wonderful idea. It's a very simple idea. It's easy to implement. And it shows you the difficulty that happens when you try to apply mathematics in the real world. There are real issues that you need to deal with. What can you do to fix them? And what I love about this is this is not high level math. You know, anybody who has looked at a clock, you know, can understand something like this. This is the same as the clock we were doing with RSA. We're just applying it again in another setting. Okay. So you know, we were a little bit ahead of schedule from yesterday. So this is basically what I wanted to say about error detection and error correction code. If your people wanted to chat for a few minutes, I'm happy to chat for a few minutes. Or... Um, yeah, discussion. Right. He's got time. <laughs> yes. Just out of curiosity. Um, in the description of the workshop yesterday, yes. it says FLT, RSA, and NSA. What is NSA? NSA is the uh, no such agency. Did Hamming leave a record of, of attempts that didn't work for him? I, I wonder how, how he came upon his code. Was that a tortuous route? He had how brilliant was there for him? He had a couple different schemes. Right. Uh, and the one that we continue with is the one that works. Yeah. Uh, right. Uh, I don't remember seeing it. Yet. I know it took a it took a while. To make it like it wasn't a oh this week I'm right. going to do this. It was a trial and error. And it wasn't just a good repetition. It was an engineer. Right. And it and I and it's what Steve said. You know. You 
start with this assumption that that there's a you know that errors are rare. Well, yes, they're rare, but they hit marks. So this is where it is. Right. 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 And again, what's nice is you can, you know, we talked about just one bit errors. So the natural question to ask students, we've said nothing about two bit errors. How would you design an efficient system? Well, don't no, scratch that. How would you design a system to deal with two bit errors? It doesn't have to be efficient. And one of my favorite quotes is, what's amazing is not that the horse sings well, but that the horse sings at all. So come up with a way to transmit messages and correct two bit errors or three bit errors. I come up with them to correct n bit errors for fixed n. Then try to do it efficiently. So the first thing is just getting something down on paper, getting something that works. And in terms of you know, what Hamming did, is I'm sure before he got to the, you know, the 7 4 code, there were small things he had that were good, but did not feel the best. You know, felt a little wasteful. Uh, in the real world, where is where are him codes used to correct errors? Yeah. I heard right. it was CDs, but I, I wanted to know from you where they use it. I'll defer to Jim. He's more of the real world than I am. Uh, it was memory access. It's not so much there. Memory access. Memory access computers? Random access. Memory access. What about CDs? What do they use for that? Uh, CDs uses tell me 16 times. <laughs> it, literally, it is tell me 16 times is what a CD does. It's oversampling. Right. You repeat it because it's it's the mechanical is the electronic is so much faster than the mechanical. Right. We can just spin it 16 times and read it and and average mm. the values and wow. take it from there. Yeah. 16. Yeah. yeah. Why 16? Power, power of two. Because it started off with one and they right. thought that wasn't good enough, so right. they went to two and then they went to four and then eight and then 16. And, so. and that's I like this. Yeah. Yeah. And, and empirically, 16 uh, is able to do enough. It will catch all errors? No. But, but the CD's sound quality is so much better than what you can hear anyway right. that it doesn't really matter. In fact, you know, we, we engineered this beautiful CD sound system and then a sample from the CD, 192 bits per second, and you transmit it to your iPhone, uh, you hear, you know, no one ever complains about the sound quality in spite of the fact well, that it has, it has totally destroyed the amount of data there. I mean, there, there was an old Steve Martin comedy sketch where he's on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, and he's actually telling stand-up jokes for dogs. So maybe if you have the dogs listening, they might be, you know, <laughs> but, it's important to know what is the purpose of the operation? What is the purpose of the activity? And you know, as Jim is saying, if we can't hear the difference, it doesn't matter if it's accurate or not. It just has to be accurate enough for the realm that we can see. But what about something that really needs to be accurate, like you know, uh, transmitting things in space and transmitting instructions in space to do something where it has to be accurate, I assume. Right. Yeah. Well, and the, the U.S. Navy won't share the secrets of how they transmit the submarines. So I suspect it still has to do with handling right. <clears throat> in there somewhere because it's a very low data rate. Right. But it has to be accurate. Right. To be right, the first mm -hmm. right. Exactly. Probably similar for stuff to you know Voyager space probes That's as they're going out, where they actually reprogrammed the probes you know, billions of miles away from Earth. Mm -hmm. Which Mars probe is to reach all that? Okay. Use what? Read Solomon? Mm -hmm. yeah. There are a lot of categories. Right. 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 Yeah. That's a nice one. Yeah. But what's nice is the general theory of simple things does not require that much mathematics. I mean, what we did today, I don't think we used any college mathematics in this. So this is stuff I've done with third and fourth graders. And what I love is the challenge is not the mathematical prerequisites, but it's the creativity. Is can you think of a good way? You know, to find the seven, you know, anybody could think of, well, I've got a finite number of dots. Let me draw a bunch of lines patiently and see what will work. And so you could actually try this for, you know, uh, well, you've already got eight and nine, but maybe there's a better nine. Maybe
Maybe there's something good for 11. And I still want us to try pyramids too. Yep. I, I think that the triangular pyramid is going to make more of it. But again, it's a, it's a theoretical thing because now data transmit, transfer rates have become so fast that it's easier just to repeat it. Yeah. And that's what TCPIP does. And, uh, I mean, the. I have, you know, Hilton Honors, so I'm not charging Dimax more. I got the high speed engine for free last night. And I couldn't really yeah. notice the, well, if not, I'll also do the bill for six months. Yeah, I did the same thing. I didn't yeah. notice the difference between the high speed and I did. the regular. I did. Oh, you did. I did. Uh, so when I was uploading the video files for YouTube, oh. the upload was almost immediate. Because I was uploading now a file on the order of maybe, you know, 70 to 80 megabytes. And just, boom, up there. It's done incredible. Well, I know the low speed is not very no, efficient. No, the low, I, I didn't want the low speed last night because of uploading, but the high speed was, was fine. Mm -hmm. And when you've reached this point, um, my dad used to work with uh, some people in high tech. I'm not sure who said this, so I will not attribute it to somebody, but you know, one of the statements was, as the cost of memory asymptotically approaches zero, you know, what are the consequences going to be? And for a lot of things now, the cost is going very close to zero in terms of how quickly we can transmit things, how much we can store. And so we don't have to be as efficient and concerned as we did before. Did you try uh, uh, geometry on a uh, fixed number of uh, points? No, I have, I have not tried more than this because I'm deliberately holding off to give my students the opportunity to be the first ones, at least among ourselves, to, to discover is I don't want to know what the answer is. It's sometimes hard as a teacher not to look forward. I remember giving a talk at a conference in New York City saying that my students will be proving the following theorem in a month. I know what's going to follow immediately from Sterling's formula and uh, binomial coefficients, but I don't know how far they're going to extend it. It's paining me not to think further about this problem, but I'm saving it for them. So it'll be very interesting to see which geometries they try. I will definitely be pushing them into the pyramid because given that the triangle is beating the square, when we go to three dimensions, we should definitely be considering you know, the triangular pyramid. Now, a lot of this becomes how good are you visually? And so certain things are easier to play with than others. My students are working on some problems in uh, finite geometry and distances. And they're trying to say, can you have a configuration with this many common distances? Well, one of the things I do is I play with Legos. And so I have a bunch of Technic uh, blocks with holes and pins. So look, here, here's a bunch of them together. Play around with it. Oh, crap. And the conjecture is disproved in half a minute. So it's how do you play with this stuff? We probably for uh, delivery this message is to uh, students. It's good to use this visualization concept. But math is much richer and uh, abstract. And uh, 